Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today's lesson is really going to be centered around people, and that is talent within an organization. And so for somebody, myself, who has led teams from two all the way up to over a thousand, where I've actually managed over a thousand people directly and indirectly, my number one asset and one of the biggest reasons why I have been successful within organizations is because of the people that I have on my team. Having this kind of data at your fingertips is absolutely critical. Now back in the day, I wish I had this kind of data, even to give me some information directionally speaking, it would have been great. And as machine learning tools become more and more mainstream, stuff like this is going to be extremely important. And it's people like you, people that work for organizations or whether you work for yourself that actually make things successful. So I am a big proponent in talent. I'm a big proponent in talent management. And I'm also a very big proponent in treating your talent properly and respectfully because it pays back in dividends. So in today's video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different, but it's also going to be pretty cool. But before I get into today's lesson, I actually want to demo what we're going to be walking through. So what you see in front of us today is you actually see an Excel spreadsheet with a few attributes about a specific person or people that work within an organization. So this is just data that I captured from Kaggle. So I didn't make this up or anything. And so what I would really like to know is based on these attributes, this is what I know. I've got about 20 candidates in front of me that are on the fence of whether or not they may stay or whether or not they may leave the organization. So let me show you the actual data before I actually show you the function. Let me show you the data here. This is the original raw data set that we were looking at. And this data set has uh, a ton of data in here. So it's got rows and rows of data. I can't remember the exact count, but we'll look at that later. But a lot of data in here, basically. And it has the exact same stuff, historically speaking, the same metrics, but it also told me whether or not they left or they stayed. Now, for some of you guys who've been watching my videos and following my channel, you know that I love machine learning. And so then you may be asking, well, how do I actually bring some of this stuff into Excel? Historically, what I've always done is I've always taken this information and I've put it into some kind of a Python file using pandas and done some manipulation against it. Today, we're going to do something different. So let me show you what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to go ahead and call a function within Excel that's going to tell us whether or not they're going to stay or go. So that function is called equals will they quit? And so you may be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Excel doesn't have that kind of a function. And as I go and highlight all these different features and I hit enter, now this is going to take a couple of seconds to render. And the reason why it's taking a couple of seconds to render is because right now it is actually running a neural network in the back end. So you can actually run a neural network or any kind of a machine learning language program in the background to compute all this for you. This is no different than when Excel pulls functions like minimum, maximum, or average, or anything around those lines. It's running some kind of a script in the background to get you that. But what we've done is actually we've automated a script so that this actually runs an entire neural network in the back end. Now this is going to take, again, probably a couple of seconds, if not maybe even up to a minute to go ahead and render. But you may be asking yourself, first of all, why am I bothering doing this in Excel when I can just perfectly go into Python, run this and get the results and export it out as a CSV? Well, truth is you can, but we have to address the elephant in the room. And that is not everybody is comfortable working in Python or working in some kind of an IDE. If you actually think about it, there's a majority of data scientists and other business analysts and other functions and such still use Excel on a day-to-day -day basis. And when you look at business analysts who don't have a lot of programming background, who want to actually take advantage of stuff like this, well, this can somewhat be intimidating. So what we've actually done by incorporating this in Excel is we've eliminated or significantly lowered the barrier of entry to use machine learning on a day-to-day -day basis. So yes, it's computationally heavy and sometimes it takes a while, but the results you can get and now the number of people that can start running these kind of things greatly increases and thus as a result starts to increase the productivity of an organization. So you must be wondering now, well, where did I get this function? How was it created and how in the world is it computing all of this stuff? So I'm going to show you that right now. Now, before I get into the actual code of bringing this into Excel, let me just give you some confidence in the machine learning model that was built. Now, I'm not going to focus today on the machine learning model in terms of how it was built and what I did. We're going to leave that for another day. But what I really want to focus on is to give you some confidence to say we actually took a machine learning model. We did some transformations to it. And then I ran a Kfolds 
cross validation against it with n equals to 3 and I got some pretty decent results. So my accuracy at first was 98.07, then 98.11, then 97.82 and if for those of you guys who are wondering well what did the confusion matrix look like I just printed the Matthews correlation coefficient which is representative of all of that great stuff which we got a pretty decent score now you may be wondering this is a pretty high score it is because i spent a lot of time tweaking this model to get it to where i felt made sense i would probably have to go back and fine tune the model to squeeze out a little bit of the noise that may bring the accuracy down a little bit but nothing that i wouldn't be confident putting this out in front of a user now originally my goal was to go ahead and pickle the results now, if you remember one of my previous video series, I created a Django REST API. And in that, I use a machine learning model to determine whether or not somebody is going to be approved or rejected for a loan. And in that, I used the pickle module. And in that, I pickled all the scalers, the model itself, and any columns that were a result of one hot encoding. And it worked fairly well with the Django framework. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm going to go ahead and link that entire video series above where I teach you from the start to the end, not only how to build that machine learning model, but how you incorporate it in the Django REST API framework. Now, originally I tried to do that with this particular model. The problem is Excel does have its limitations and those limitations in this case were the fact that this is a little bit computationally heavy and possibly not the greatest fit for something like Excel. So let's go through the code and let me just walk you through how we did this. So if you remember in the previous video, I actually showed you how to use something called Excel Wings. And if you don't know how to use Excel Wings, watch the video right before this and I'll link that video above as well so you can take a look. So I'm not going to explain Excel Wings in this particular video, but watch it in the one before and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Now, in order to create this, we need a few things. We need two files. In my first file, I actually have the machine learning model itself. And I made a few changes to this machine learning model. Remember I just finished saying that I tried to use the pickle method, but it was way too slow. So I actually used something called model checkpoint within TensorFlow. What model checkpoint allows you to do, which is right here, what model checkpoint is gonna allow you to do is it's gonna add every single interval. So after every single epoch, it's gonna go ahead and give you an idea of how your model is actually working. So you can test your model mid training if you wanted to. And this is really good for certain models that take you know days, if not weeks to actually train or things that are just continuously training over time every single time. And so by using this, you can do a few things. You can avoid things like overfitting by early termination, and you can also test your values along the way if you want to see what your model looks like so far. So what you find in this model, I just basically went ahead and I defined the model itself. So I brought in the original raw data. Now in this case, this could be something like a database for you or it could be another Excel file. Basically did some computations to it just to split out the Y and the X or the Y and the features in this case. Um, I did use a little bit of upsampling. I tried downsampling it. I tried other sampling methods. I just found this one worked the best. You don't have to sample it if you don't want to. You can try to get away without it. But for me, I just wanted a balanced data set. So I went ahead and used Smote to do the sampling. And then finally, I created a deep learning network here, which is a four layer neural network. And as I create that neural network, the goal is to go ahead and do a K-folds test against it along the way. And that's where you saw that 90-ish percentile uh, accuracy. So this just will start, this is just going to help me create the function to initiate the neural network. Now, when I go into hr.py, this is where all the magic happens. There's a few things that are gonna happen in here. First and foremost, I need to go ahead and include this file that we just reviewed. So I said from additional model import create model because create model is the name of the function that I had created here. And then the rest of it is just your standard machine learning libraries for the most part, pandas, tensorflow, um, job lib, all that other kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and follow this as Excel would see it. So the first thing you notice is what is I call this function, will they quit? And that's where this function is coming from. I can call this whatever, whatever I want. And then I went ahead and I said, all right, I'm going to pass in a list. That list was, was me highlighting all the different rows in Excel. So as I went across like this, it went ahead and it created a list for me. Then what I did is I unpacked that list. I knew what my column names were going to be, which is basically the original column names here. And then I did something called unpacking. I said, set all my column names equal to the data. And that is basically the data that's coming in over here, which is the data. And by unpacking it, every single row that I 
basically copied and pasted gets allocated in the same order. So order does matter that I define my actual column names here. And this is just a replica of down here. I just put this in a list format itself and just call it columns because I'm going to need it later below. I went ahead and I created a data frame with the data that came in. And then I said these were the column names. Now this is where the fun part comes. Remember, this data is not one hot encoded. So I had to actually take this entire data frame, dump it up here and say, the one hot encoded columns for me are gonna be department and salary. And just make sure that when my final data frame comes out, it is totally one hot encoded. And again, if you go ahead and watch that video on machine learning and the Django framework, I actually have this exact same function in there. And I walk you through step-by-step step what this function does. So if you wanna learn more about it, check that video out for sure. So now I have a new data frame, which has been one hot encoded, which is called df.new or df underscore new. I go ahead and I create an instance of that model. So remember I brought in create model, which is from my other file. I create an instance of it. So it has basically gone ahead and created this entire model under the actual variable model. Now, this is where I actually said, we're gonna go ahead and load the weights. And my, my weights are actually loaded in a checkpoint file. Now, what I didn't show you here is I actually took out that line of code here because when I took this over into Windows, for whatever reason, it was playing a few funny tricks on me. But I'm going to go ahead and show you what that code looks like right now. And that is over here. So I would just go ahead and add this code right back where it was. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm going ahead and calling the model checkpoint method. In that, I've specified my checkpoint path. Uh, and I also said save only the weights because that's really all I need. And then when I go ahead and fit my model, I would just go here and say callback is equal to, and then because I call this callback, I would just call it CP underscore callback. And so what this is doing right now is I took whatever output this is going to create, whatever, uh, so it's going to basically drop the callback file in this training file or in this training folder. I basically took that file and I just transferred it over into Windows or into my virtual box. And all it's doing in this case is it's just pulling that file, those weights from this location. So that's really all it's doing. So I said, go ahead and load those weights. That's going to be a part of my model. Then I said, I also have scalers because I did go ahead and scale my original data. And that is right over here. So if you look at my original model, I had to scale this information. And so as it scaled that information, it scaled it on this specific model. So I want to capture those scalers back. Then I went ahead and transformed the new data frame. And in this case, remember this data frame, this DF underscore new is only going to be represented by one row. So one row is going to be a new data frame because I'm calling this method on every single line. Finally, I went ahead and predicted it. I set my threshold to 0.55. I just found that worked really well. And it goes, goes and returns Y predicted, which is going to be either true or false in this case. All right, so let's just go ahead and create one for fun here. We'll say this is going to be equal to say 0.71 or so. Finally, we will say that they're low. All right, so the question now is, will they stay? So will they quit? Sorry, I mean. So let's go ahead and take this information. And it's going to take, like I said, it's going in the background running this machine learning model. Sounds like they're not going to quit, which is all right. It's not too bad. All right, what if this person has actually, let's just say they have seven years in this company. So let's see what happens now with the model. All right, so now it actually looks like they may quit. And that actually does make a little bit of sense. So they've been with the company for seven years. They have not had a promotion. They're still, you know, paid fairly low. Um, and I mean, overall, they probably got a good review. So they're wondering, why didn't I get promoted? And their satisfaction is somewhat okay. So this, this model, just by looking at it, actually kind of makes sense to me. Now, let's say I change this back to five. So we'll say that this, so again, if an HR person is evaluating things like this, I mean, this is a good option. I mean, this isn't going to be, you know, perfect, but it's going to be an indicator and possibly directionally relevant for them to actually make a decision on saying, if this is top talent, then maybe we want to do something about it. For example, what if we change this person, we moved them out of HR and we just put them into sales. I wonder if they would stay or not. So they would, looks like. And that is maybe because they've come, maybe they've come to realize that HR just doesn't have the opportunities they're looking for, and now they want to do something else. Uh, maybe sales does. Maybe in sales you start getting paid low originally because you see most of these sales jobs are fairly low, and you make more over time, or there's a commission involved which is not included in this. Who knows? 
But at the end of the day, this is a great way for somebody in an organization to start having some original insight into how their talent is doing. Because I will tell you, I have ran teams to as large as over a thousand people. And I can tell you that talent is such an important criteria, such an important key into your success and into your organization's success. So I always say, treat your talent right. They will treat you right as well. And as a result, they will treat the organization well as well. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. And if you did, please consider liking and subscribing. And I will talk to you next time. Take it easy. Bye.